Hi, I'm Will Jarvis. And I'm Will's dad. We both love and are fascinated by stories. Stories about people. Stories about places. And stories about events. Our stories give shape and form to life. They give texture, color, and rhythm to the blank canvas that every new day presents to us. And they do that by informing us of our past as a directional marker for our future. Okay, Will, it's narrative time. Tell me a story. Welcome to the Narratives Podcast. Today we're on the campus of North Carolina State University. We're at the, the brand new Centennial Campus. Semi-illegally. Semi, oh, shh. I'm not supposed to say that. No, no, no. <laughs> completely legally. It's completely all legit. We're sitting um, 12 feet apart as we, we speak. We are 35 feet apart as we speak. I'm like see glass panels. Oh, my God. Um, Much like the Democratic National Convention, we are Zooming in today. We're Zooming in together. Um, so today I've got my two siblings here. I've got on my left, I've got Glenn. Hey, guys. And Glenn is a student. He's a med- mechanical engineering man- major. Mechanical engineering major here at North Carolina State University. Oh, yeah? You're entering your fourth? Fourth and hopefully final year. Hopefully. Four out of six. Four out, oh, <laughs> my God. Like, how? Uh, that's awesome. And then on my right, I have Faith Jarvis, my sister. That's me. And uh, she is a... What, what's what's your, your scientist at Thermo Fisher? Scientist? I do analytical development for clinical trials. So what does that mean? It means that somebody has to make the initial batches for research studies and clinical trials, and someone has to make the quality controls and look at every single vial that comes off of the lines to make sure there's not hair in it. So that's what I do. It's pretty intensive mm-hmm. and very important. You don't want your hair in your your clinical trials. It kind of throws things off. Yeah. Little little human DNA. That's awesome. So uh, today we're actually on the Centennial campus. The bougie campus. It's uh, it's quite quite beautiful. We're actually in an, kind of an abandoned classroom right now. It's kind of scary to yep. look at. Um, it's 96 degrees in here, but we're doing fine. And we're doing fine. We're doing fine. We actually got run off from the library. Yep. Um, we were outside trying to record, and yeah, all the, all the, crazy times. Crazy. No, time. you can't eat them donuts. No eating donuts <laughs> outside no eating donuts. at the library. It's very, which yeah. is very interesting. And we do eat donuts here. Since they do sell donuts in the library, so <laughs> yeah. a little bit of an antitrust case there. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely a, it was a there's a monopoly issue paging uh, <laughs> uh, all the congressional Democrats. We have a big problem here at North Carolina <laughs> State. University, you know, big donut is really keeping us down, man. Um, oh, man, very cool. So today we wanted to come together because we're all working on a, uh, a startup idea together, which I think is really cool. Um, and we want to talk about that, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But first off, I just wanted to introduce both of you, um, kind of talk about kind of how we all intersect together, kind of our common interests and uh, a lot of things we like to think about. Um, kind of on a daily basis and read about it because I think you guys have a really unique perspective on life, the universe, and everything, as Douglas Adams so kindly likes to say. So, uh, so Glenn, you're currently a, a fourth-year mechanical engineer yep. here at State. Um, so what about mechanical was, was interesting to you? Um, when I was looking through the majors, I was like, oh, totally. I, I knew I wanted to do engineering. I was a big Lego kid as a kid, and... Um, I didn't find anything with medicine interesting, and I didn't find anything with a softer science or humanities interesting. And so um, I decided, you know what, I'll just, I'll go really basic, and I'll just say anything mechanical. I'll do this mechanical engineer. And I actually came in as a neuroscience major, and I was like, all right, well, this sounds, I don't like this whole life science thing. So I went for mechanical engineering, and I got into some, you know, higher level calculus, and I realized, like, oh, this isn't as intense and crazy and nerdy as people were, are saying. I really think that almost anybody can understand, like, early calculus. And you don't have to be that smart to understand, like, even, like, Calc 2, Calc 3 type stuff. Well, it's already all been derived for you, so. Exactly. exactly. Hard work's been done. <laughs> and I, I really think, you know, in primary schooling, they, they give math a bad name. They give design a bad name. And... Uh, everybody's like, I, I never want to do math when I grow up because I, I was horrible and it was cool, but I, I don't know. I found that that was not the correct case when I got into engineering. And I think it's really fun. I love modeling. I love uh, data manipulation with a little bit of coding and stuff like that. And, um, and, and you're talking about calculus. I think it's 
this this will relate to kind of some things we talked about a little bit later in the podcast. But um, you know, do you remember? Do you do you know when cactus was invented? Uh, After the creation of Oxford get, University get, is get, all I know. Yeah, getting the area under the curve. Seventeenth century. Seventeenth century. Can you believe that? So that's pretty crazy. We're like four hundred years on from you know Isaac Newton and. So humans have lived a long from. time without understanding calculus, is what I'm hearing. They, we did, have, did not know how to get the area under a curve for a while. Um, <laughs> and we did so, just fine. And we did just, just <laughs> Except but, for all the murder and the rape, and it was great. Oh, God, yeah, so a lot of ads. So I, I just think that is super interesting, because now we teach that to high school kids. Yeah. yeah. Like, and uh, I mean, you can derive a lot of classical mechanics without calculus, is what I found. But now we, we teach it with calculus. Which is, I mean, Would you just Newton use basic algebra if you didn't have calculus, or is that sort of... You can use basic algebra, and then there's also, um, there's methods of, like, you can do it analytically. Like, you mm -hmm. can say, you know, we're going to plot it out on a curve, and then, oh, this kind of fits, and then you can test it, test, test it, and say, okay, well, yeah, it's pretty much F does equal MA. And you don't have to say, oh, if acceleration is the derivative of velocity, which is the derivative of, you know, position with respect to time, I mean, you can just say acceleration is how velocity changes with time. You know, you don't actually have to understand what a derivative is. You can just say how it changes with. And you don't know how, you need to know the mathematical operators to actually describe motion with. And so I don't, uh, and now we, we teach it with the, with the mathematical operators, right? With the d over dt and stuff like that. Do That's you okay. find that a better or worse way to teach people? Is it more or less intuitive? Than just saying this is just the change over time, um, or do you just need that foundation to really move up in the physics world? I think it's a better way to understand it if you know how the calculus works, but it's not a better way to understand it if you're just trying to learn the physics and you're not really understanding how the calculus works. Because anybody can learn something like the power rule and just know, okay, that works like it does. But you know, if you don't understand it the way that people understand addition, where it's like, oh, I have two things and two other things, that means I have four things now. Like, that's just how addition works. But, like, calculus should be understood by all people, not by all people, but by, by you know, people learning physics and stuff like that, just like that. Like, change over time is something that's pretty simple. And, you you know, we, we, we get lost when we say, when we just start memorizing, like, this is a chain rule, this is u-substitution, this is a power rule. And when you get into that, like, a little bit higher calculus than from high school and... So, you know, people stop understanding the, the, what's really behind the physics when they're in the early physics classes, definitely. And I, w a, a real problem is in the engineering classes, uh, the early physics classes for engineers are not taught by engineering professors, and they're not taught by the good physics professors. They're taught by the bottom of the barrel physics professors. And I know this because like, I've talked to a lot of physics people. And I know this because all of my engineering friends say, oh, I hated physics one, I hated physics two, right? Because what, what they do is they take, you know, those physics professors who really aren't doing too well and who might have tenure or something like that, who are only caring about, oh, yes, I'm doing this really intense, you know, uh, study on how quarks interact with blah, blah, blah. And, then, okay, now i got to go teach some stupid old mechanical engineers about how force equals mass times acceleration. They don't even know vectors. How does someone come out of high school without knowing vectors? Well, I, I had never heard the term vectors. vector before I graduated high school. Like. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and it's like such a simple idea, and then like no one teaches it well. It's and they're just like, here's a vector in yeah. like physics one, and I'm like, I don't know what the fuck that means, but I'm right, here's a vector in my notes. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, uh, what, when do they even teach us vectors in like, pre-algebra in high school. I took that when I was a sophomore in high school. And now I'm coming in as an engineer and I know like, I'm pretty good at calculus, I know it. And I'm like, hold up, physics one, like vectors? What, I don't even understand. And then they're, they're like, oh yeah, there's the X, Y, and Z directions. And I kind of understand that, right? Because I like, I like, I don't know, I've, I've done yeah. some drawing or whatever. Definitely. And, but like, they don't say, and there's these kind of relations that like kind of relate them. But the rest of it is just like, oh, you just have equations in each direction. Right? Yeah. I had no concept of that because they, they literally didn't even cover vectors in physics one, which is the basis of not only physics one and two and like all of my solids and dynamics and fluids and heat transfer classes. It's like this is the, the basis on which you build 
your understanding in three dimensions, and it's just not there. It's a, they just don't even teach it to you. So. And then they were like, "Here's an array," and I'm like, "But what does the comma mean?" Right? Like, there's a comma and what? <laughs> like, well, what? This... There's commas and math now. This is bullshit. What the they put letters. Does in a that while mean ago? it's a really three, thirty-three thousand? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Pretty interesting. Yeah, it's super interesting. You mentioned so. Uh, I just finished a book on uh, academia, and it's actually it's entitled uh, "Good Work If You Can Get It." By Jason Brennan. Do you guys know Jason Brennan? I have no idea. Uh, he's just like a uh, libertarian philosopher. He might have taken us to be calling him that. But from the <laughs> University of Arizona, um, teaches at Georgetown now. I read like one of his textbooks in college. Uh, but it, it's really interesting. So he just does this giant deep dive. Like if you want to work in academia, this is what you have to do. Essentially, it's all publishing. So like you go in a PhD, you need to publish. Like that's all you need to do. That's all that matters other than passing and going to the highest, best school you can. But it's interesting because... Um, at R1 Research Universities, which we're sitting at one right now, you know, UNC, Duke, NC State, um, essentially the highest status thing is being a researcher, and it's like low status to just be a lecturer. So it's actually a different like class of professor that teaches most of the classes. Does that make sense? So lecturers do not have voting rights. What? Oh man, it's so so you know, academia is quite. Um, you know, just, and this is an empirical fact, is it's overwhelmingly um, left-wing. You know, it, it, it's, it's empirically true. Like, you know, it's 25 to 1 in some fields. It could, it's as high as, like, 50 to 1 in, like, academic soci sociology. And that's, like, uh, you know, liberals to moderates. I mean, that's not even, like, you know, there, there are very few conservatives, which is interesting because um, the whole system is incredibly hierarchical. <laughs> I mean, like, oh my God, like, this is the most it's hierarchical. It's not a democracy. No, it, it is nothing near a democracy. The people that are lecturers, they don't even get to vote on anything. I always heard that upper level academia was like the mob because it's a bunch of people slaving away on the off chance they'll win the lottery and get to be tenured. Like, the low level drug dealers work, so on the off chance they'll get to be the big boss one day and make a bunch of money. It, it is very simple. And the, the one thing that was interesting in the book, I, I didn't realize this, is essentially. If you don't land a tenure track job out of the PhD program almost immediately, your chances of getting one essentially none, zero. Really? So, you, like, if you went out and you're like, "Oh, I'm just going to be a lecturer, or a postdoc," or the, well, postdocs that's kind of a different case, but I'm going to be like an adjunct or something like that, you'll never get tenure essentially. Is that because they don't want to take a chance on you, or the PhD students coming out are just that much more impressive because the field has advanced? Uh, I think it's both. I think it's incredibly competitive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's subsidized, so there's like this glut. There's a glut of uh, PhDs. There's not like a. There's there's actually a lot of jobs, but there's a huge glut of production of academics now, um, and it's you know it's good work if you can get it. I mean, that's a really good title because, you know, a R1 research university professor that's tenured is expected to work 200 hours a year. The rest is up to them. I heard that the biggest <laughs> downfall of modern society is probably going to be elite yes. overproduction because what, what? it's going to be elite overproduction because everybody wants a really great, meaningful job, and if they don't get it, they're going to go out and riot because it's got to be somebody's fault. You have a degree and a PhD from Harvard, and you can't be a professor, and you have to go and work as a barista like, at Starbucks and can't yeah, study yeah, like medieval literature all the time. So, like, whose fault is that? Right, so I know last year Columbia, so I was an English major, funny enough, I really stand out in this crowd. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the English PhDs uh, at Columbia, there were six of them. They graduated, and none of them got a tenure track, track job on Columbia, which is pretty interesting. So you were talking about elite overproduction. Yeah. Um, so how did reading Shakespeare help you in your life? Well, you know, I don't know. That's like 40 I read, hours I read a lot life, of things like, but, yeah. that were helpful. I, mm -hmm. Shakespeare, Shakespeare moderately, not so much. Moderately, I don't know. And I don't, I don't mean to rag on English majors, but, like, I will, to, be, but to be totally fair, like, Will's probably the most business successful person out of the three of us. <laughs> like, like, for sure. I, I know I'm only, like, a well, college student. Of still, course, but, like, I know a Japanese major, and she never learned Japanese, so it could have been worse. Right, so, <laughs> yeah. so and, and I do find that uh, people always get the wrong message. I think I've told you guys this before, the, the wrong message when I say this. Um, they always, always misconstrue this. Um, so I'll say, you know, like, oh, like, what major were you, and why would why'd you do it, and, you know, was it helpful? And they, and they say, you know, uh, and I was like, well, you know, I was an English major, and I find it was helpful because I think there is, there, I recognize early on there was this kind of elite overproduction phenomenon, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I don't really love that term, but I think it, it does identify something real. Um, so I, I, I noticed there was this phenomenon, and there was this idea that STEM would save you. Like, and, and this won't. is still commonplace, yeah. STEM will save you. And I had no illusions about that. 
I had because there was no chance that the degree would provide any sense of like uh, protection or, any, or in the economic job market. Security. Yeah, economic security. So it really forced me to confront that a lot earlier than essentially anyone else. But other than you're graduating, you're now like, oh no. Right, exactly. Because I think that that happened to quite a few people I know. It's like, oh my god, here we are. I'm like, well, you know, I've been working on this for three and a half years, like as hard as I can, and that set me up well. Whereas um, I think, and you know, I've been telling you guys that for a while, so I, I kind of came before you, so you're able to, you know, it, learn these lessons earlier. Um, but I think, and, and people always get the wrong message out of that, like, oh, well, you know, the degree was probably actually helpful, and I'm like, no, I don't, I don't really think it was very helpful. <laughs> it was, it was a consumption good. I think it was quite good, and I had a lot of time to um, read a lot of things, which I think is, is really valuable. Like I would just go to the library and I would just pull books off the shelf and whatever subject I was interested in. And it's like you hear Elon Musk. He, how do you learn about rockets? He went and he read, read Von Braun's book on rocketry, right? I mean, yeah, like, fair enough. I mean, that's the best way to learn things. So, you know, I, I find that's much easier than, you know, just some research professor who does not give a rat's ass about teaching. I mean, Excuse me, all the kids listening. I know a bunch of second year, third year um, aerospace engineers and they don't even know what Delta V is. It's like, oh, I'm finally, oh, I'm so glad I'm in my aerospace class. So I've been so, like, I've been waiting for so long to actually learn how to make a rocket, right? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're in your third year, and you haven't even learned anything about rockets? Like, I mean, and then I look at it, and I'm like, wait, I'm in my third, fourth year of mechanical engineering. I've, you know what I've designed? You know what I've engineered? I've engineered a boat made of cardboard, like, yeah. That's it. That's it. Yep. And, uh, you know what? It was a it was a pretty good boat. I gotta say, I love my boat, and it was with a team of really good people too. But so I, I learned how to like kind of work as a team. But like really, like I'm here to learn about not like oh how to learn about engineering. It's like I want to know how to engineer, and I shouldn't have to wait until my fourth semester. And I, I mean, I'm that's hoping, right. That's right. right. That's I'm right. finally in a, in two separate engineering classes where like they're called design <laughs> of, and that makes me like hopeful for the future, right? But I don't know. I mean, it still seems like it still seems like. Well, hold up, uh, where's all the engineering at? <laughs> right, like where's the actual engineering? And and that brings up a really good point. Um, I I I really like science, and this is tied up with all the elite overproduction. I, I think science as a method is a very powerful thing. Um, I believe you can find the truth with science, which I, you can't really do with anything else. Right, you which, just find things. Exactly. So maybe it's true. <laughs> exactly. So th th that's incredibly like powerful. religion. You can find stuff. You find right? stuff, but, but it's, with science, it's, you can find the separate. truth. Um, but I do find there's this there's a meme in the culture that goes around right now, um, and it's mostly from left left wing people directed more at right wing people, um, and I won't comment on any of that. That's a whole different thing we can talk about, but. Um, and, and the idea is like, uh, you don't trust science. Yeah. And, and I think, so I don't trust science. And what they're really saying is not that I, that, that people that they don't agree with don't believe in this objective method. It's that people do not believe in technocratic experts. Yeah. Um, they don't believe in the institution. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. And well, have I you seen the replication crisis in psychology? And as it like spreads and spreads and sort of metastasizes <laughs> into like bigger. actual sciences, you know? Exactly. exactly. Like, now it's in like biochemistry, and I'm like, oh Jesus! And I'm like paging through the pages and pages of the studies that are getting recalled. Yeah. And I'm like, Jesus! Like, how are we ever going to know anything if you can just say right. whatever you want in scientific journals so that are peer reviewed? Right. So, so exactly. So mm -hmm. it, this huge distinction between science as a high status institution and the process itself. Mm -hmm. Anyone can do the process, which I think is very important. I want to, everyone, all our listeners to understand. Anyone can do the process of science, forming a hypothesis and testing it. If you've seen Mythbusters, you can do science. <laughs> you can do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't even have to watch that many episodes. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like, like three just, episodes. Just you, right? Um, the ones where you say, if you don't write it down, you're just screwing around, <laughs> just blow. write that down. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, but, but between the institution, and I think our institutions are very sick, and this is something I think we all believe in. Um, our scientific institutions especially. So one of the examples, Faith, you just mentioned, the replication crisis, um, which is fascinating. I, I was going to mention your point, which you just said, that uh, you know it started in psychology and social psychology. And I think the reason we called it there first was because... because it's really it, easy to test to replicate. Anyone to replicate. test and replicate, and everyone understands it. Mm -hmm. um, what I do wonder about is, uh, you know, quantum physics, where there are probably 30 people in the world who can understand some of these problems. They call it the... Um, 
the theory of everything now because they're super certain that it's like very true. But six years ago, they were also calling it the theory of everything. Exactly, right? exactly. And like, like, oh, there's quirks and ends, and you're like, I don't know how much you really believe that, but uh, you sure do have tenure. So right, right, exactly. And do. so it, we have to like cast a lot of skepticism because they're very small groups. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, and there's no way to objectively evaluate it from where we're sitting. Um, so unless you have another CERN, right? Yeah, another right. sorry, if I build our own. And another that's 30 another people 30 who understand science, how to use it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I, I think that's that's super fascinating that, uh, you know, so this replication crisis, and what the replication crisis is, I think we should probably define that just in case the reader hasn't heard about it. Um, so it started with power posing. I don't know if you guys remember this. There's a famous TED Talk. Oh, I hate TED Talks so much, man. Oh, God. Don't get me started on TED Talks. Yeah. Um, so, and, you know, the the... There was a famous Harvard psychologist, and she's like, look, I found this great thing. If you power pose, you need to flex in front of the mirror before your interview, you know, you go, rah. I mean, standing like woman, Wonder Woman for people who can't see us. Right, so yeah. you stand like they Wonder Woman. Spread mm-hmm. arms, spread legs. Spread arms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, stand like a man. Show off those lats, right? So <laughs> you, uh, you, you, uh, you do the power pose, and then um, I, you get some benefit, like you're more confident or yeah, something. Yeah, you're more confident. Yeah, in, in the interview. Yeah, serotonin, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah. it's a... Yeah, you feel more self confident. Yeah, and so it and then they perform better on like interviews. That's right, and it, and it turns out this is like completely does not replicate. Is, <laughs> there's no effect. There's no effect. And this person had made a bunch of money on the book, and it was like, you know, it was very bad. Like so, the Andrew Gelman came in and they're like, oh, look at they have these people p hacking. They're going all these statistical things. Oh, tell them what p hacking is. Uh, how, what, so p hacking is you have a set of data and you have a bunch of hypotheses like oh maybe x correlates with a b c d or e and if it doesn't correlate with four of them but it does correlate with one of them you can say look at that it correlates with f and you sort of hide the fact you've also tested for all of these other things but statistically if you test something enough times and you include enough variables some of those are going to correlate right so you have to pre-register your hypothesis and then say what you're going to test for, like before you do it. You can't go back and say, "Oh, this is oh, my look data." At this. This is great. Like, oh, look, I found this effect. So, so yeah. this is. Uh, do you guys uh, have you heard of this book? You might have heard of this book, Glenn. Um, it's a famous book on relationships, and I'm I'm naked, blanking on the guy's name right now. Very famous uh, marriage counselor. Yeah. Uh, what was this guy's name? Uh, oh man, y'all keep talking while I. Can we go back to p-hacking while he's looking for that? Mm-hmm. Because I, I took statistics, and I really believe in statistics, and I know they, they, that if you like actually understand how they work, it's, it's easier to not be fooled. But this p-hacking thing, I, I don't really understand it. And I know I, I kind of have a notion of what alpha values are, right? And I kind of have a notion of like what p-values are, but I don't really... So can, could you reiterate on... So if you have a bunch of hypotheses... So like imagine you're rolling a dice, and you say... Okay, if I stand on one foot and I roll the dice, it makes it come up on twos more because magic is real. Okay. So you try that and you're like, oh, Jesus, this doesn't work. And so you try a bunch of different things. You try just standing on the other foot. You try waving your other hand around in the air. You try, like, headbanging while you do it. And so statistically, you're going to end up with, like, more heads or, like, more rolling only twos on dice. Like just because one variation. Time. Yeah, eventually yeah, very, you're okay. going to end up with twos every time in a row. And you say, look at that. When I stand on my head and chant Karma Sutra, it always <laughs> rolls on twos, right? <laughs> but it, that didn't have any effect. It was just chance that made that happen, basically. Okay. Just because if you run something enough times, standard variability, normal variability, yeah, like you have say, a, um, eventually it's going to kind of match Bayesian dis- What distribution is that when it's like perfect? A normal distribution? A normal distribution, yeah. If you have that, then eventually one time it's going to all end up on twos, right? Gotcha. But, that's pretty interesting. Fair enough. Yeah. And that's, that's because you're playing the meta game, right? You're saying out of the statistics of the statistics. Yeah, you can find anything, you know? Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And find something that's uh, enticing enough to publish. Yeah, and then... You get tenure. Six years later, somebody comes and says, oh, this doesn't really replicate. And you're like, oh, maybe you weren't chanting the Karma Sutra loud enough. Exactly. And, like, you can really just bury anything also. And, like, you have tenure, and the people replicating it are probably lecturers, right? They don't vote in Right, they can't, they can't vote. They have no power. First right? to be so, fired when yeah. coronavirus comes. So how loudly are they going to say this is actually bullshit? And also with replication problems, I mean – you have to replicate and replicate and replicate and replicate, right? I have, there was a story of uh, when I was back in life science, when I came in as neuro, um, my professor in my intro to life science class said, you know, oh, he told us a story about there was this grad student and uh, 
they were tasked with their first thing, and they were supposed to read this and replicate this study. And like they, they you know, they they were so optimistic. They were they were so happy because it looked like a pretty easy thing to do as a grad student. And they did it, and it didn't come out right. And they did it, and it didn't come out right. And this happens for you know two years of their life, and they're like. They're like, you know, going crazy because it's like, how I must be a failure as a scientist, right? How easy should it be to replicate this simple study about two worms? And then it turns out, you know, somebody comes in, you know, a, a tenured professor takes a look at it and is doing it, and he put, they put more resources towards it. And I mean, the best thing they could do when they, because eventually it was, oh, what happened is someone falsified evidence, right? And so. Now I've wasted uh, two years of my life as gone. a grad student. I can't become, I'm not on the path Will was talking about. I can't become a yeah, tenured be professor and only work R1. 200 hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Get a six-figure job, adjunct. right? Yeah, I'm going like, to have to be a barista now. Yeah. Right, exactly. Now I have to teach this lowly LSC student, life science student, yep. uh, intro to, and I'm, how, why it's bad to falsify data. <laughs> like, yeah. And what, what ended up happening was... Um, you know, they could prove that the data was falsified, but the only thing you can really do in science is you can go in front of a, like this conference, this national conference, and you can say, we were unable to replicate, replicate this, and that's like a, ooh, as a scientist, you're like, oh, that's a big, what, pow. But right? as like a civilian, you're like, oh, but you're unable oh, oh, to okay. relocate, and you're like, I don't know what that means. I don't means. know what that means, I don't no, care. Maybe like, they didn't okay. even well, try, they just know. slept all the time. Who cares you know? that they get this huge government grant for this giant scientist, you know, years earlier to go and learn about tube worms, and then they were just like lazy and falsified data, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And also, they made a big discovery about that specific tube worm, um, enzyme that they were talking about is it was a hemoglobin that could hold 200 times the oxygen and so they said oh we, we found that it had zinc on this place instead of copper or something like that mm -hmm. and it was like a huge hemoglobin and so what they were doing is they said oh okay what we're going to do is we're going to make a company and it's going to use these giant mm. hemoglobins as to increase like oxygen combat separately. yeah exactly yeah. combat medic aids where you don't have to refrigerate like plasma and you can just like inject people with super oxygenated blood so that like you can get them to a hospital. And it, they, they went to file a patent, and a patent had already been filed by the person who had falsified the data for, with yeah, and so it's like, so they have something that just wouldn't work because they falsified the data. And it's yeah. like, so bad science, not only does it, can it like ruin a grad student's life, right, right. it can ruin the potential for innovation in the future, like for really big things, all of things that like, like who would think it's that the a tube worm of he, research science, you know? yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, and like probably the research professor was like, "Oh, I'll just scribble down some numbers. It's two worms. This is never going to affect anything." Exactly. That's right. right. Like they they wrote CU because they were lazy instead mm -hmm. of like actually finding out that it was ten or I, yeah. I don't right. remember. Okay. So th this is a, that's a great segue to kind of talk about um, kind of our views on on so the science is the institution. Um, I think we all three of us fundamentally agree that uh, it's broken. Oh yeah, it it does not work, and I think this is most. Oh, quick segue on. I did a biochemistry yeah. degree, so I think that's the most skilled job oriented degree really currently that you can get if yeah. you just really need a job because you're poor. So they teach you all of these skills, so you can just go and work in a lab somewhere and be like a yeah. wage slave. But I got into this to my first job, and the skills they had taught us were like 60 years out of date. Really? Like, Ooh. they never go back and update them, because there's no update. profit in there's, that. There's like, no the professor's going to move on in two years. That's right. So they have to, industry has to retrain every new graduate on the oh, new wow. way of doing things, which, which is, is a so huge investment, yeah. Yeah, so the university system, well, we all know they're behind, and they're not incentivized to student success on that, that side. But on the other side, um, you know, science went from wacky people with really weird ideas. So Isaac Newton... His two great interests were uh, gravity, physics, and alchemy. Okay? <laughs> like, no, I'm serious. Like, this you can look real. this up. Like, well, look it could have up. been that alchemy was real and gravity was not. You know, like, it was, you know, it's you a toss-up. Like, you know, toss-up like, back then, know. you don't know, yeah. right? So, um, and I think we, what we've really lost is that now the people that um, work in science are all politicians. And they're all salesmen. Because you've got to sell the papers and you've got to sell the grant givers. Um, and if you can do that, you'll be successful, and you'll have this great 200-hour-a-year job. If you don't, you're working at Starbucks. I think also, as you sort of work really hard to open the field to, like, white men who aren't rich and women and, like, people yeah. of color, as you do that, there are so many more qualified applicants trying to get into those right, positions right, right. that you have to sell so much harder. Like, if 
there are five million right, dollar people right. who can just work in science for free, then they can all do whatever they want. But if there are 5,000 applicants for this one job, then they have to sell in politics. Yep. And I don't have a solution for that. And I do think it is really important to have women and minorities in scientific positions. But that is an uh, issue you run into because everyone is equally qualified. Right. So there's a lot more smart people. Mm -hmm. So um, and, and that, that brings me back to just the fact that, okay, the grant process, this, this is a big idea we have, and this is a startup we're actually working on. Um, the grant process is fundamentally broken, and what it does, it's a time and materials contract that doesn't pay you for outcome. So it incentivizes people to drag things out, to do shoddy research, you know, do P hacking, doesn't matter, right? Like My professor used to talk about how she would extend, she would write grants for tenure projects before she had, like, project ideas, and then she would just apply Yep. That and be like, oh, this will totally take 10 years because it's so hard to get new grants. And she had to eat, so. Right, right. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you look, the productivity of science scientists today is about 2% of what it was in 1940. Statistically, how are you going to like so it? It's very difficult. There's, a, there's an economist at Stanford. Make that repeatable, that study. Yeah, yeah that, right. that's very difficult, right? But I think anecdotally this is true because technology has slowed down so much. You know, technology is the younger brother of science. And if science, uh, the, our rate of discoveries has mm -hmm. gone down a lot, I think things have gotten a little bit harder. But even that, I mean, we teach calculus to high school students now, right? So, I mean, we're so far ahead in that sense where we didn't even know that f existed 400 years ago or how that worked. Um, and so the idea we have here um, is that you could pay for outcomes more directly. So if you actually put out bounties for achievable, this is really important, um, achievable near-term um, advancements in science, and I think also provable. And provable, mm -hmm. like that, that's it's very important. important. That's very important. And that's where um, you guys really come in. Um, that would be incredible. So you, our idea is you take philanthropist money, which, you know, that's my special skill set on the business side. Startups, been working on it for five years. I've learned a lot, right? I think there's so much philanthropic money out there trying to reach. Being misspent. Yeah, being misspent. But people are so desperate to help other people and, like, advanced technology for the betterment of the human race right, and it's right. so hard to find things that your money will actually help exactly so like you know coming up with these roadmaps that are very detailed and include like this is the next step this is achievable within a short period of time um we'll put up the bounty because like most bounties today are huge it's like okay make the mice live three times as long well that's Get not a billion feasible. Dollars. that's not feasible without a billion dollars of research money right and like and you need that up front because you got to buy the mice you, you know? got to buy the mice yeah. you know it's really expensive right so the idea is that you know you two are especially talented and skilled in in, in having the ability to ferret out these problems and find the right ones and i have a special talent in building out and finding um the money to go with it right and, and on top of that um We've got extremely high trust. So, you know, like, it's, this is a very yeah. high trust society. Because if Will ran off with all the money, it would be real awkward it'd at Thanksgiving. Be very, very awkward yeah. at Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know, it's not like we met these guys, you know, two months ago at some mm -hmm. startup conference. Like, we've known each other for a very long time. So that's kind of one of the My entire ideas. life. Will, you've been yeah, leasing that BMW? I thought you <laughs> bought it all. <laughs> oh, my God, right? So, uh... Anyways, that, that, that's uh, you ran off and got married. Like, that's <laughs> oh, no. oh no, oh that's happening. Now she owns years. half of all your assets. That's crazy, right? It's <laughs> nuts. It's nuts. Um, so we've been we've been thinking about that. I, I want to get back to elite overproduction a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, Faith, uh, have you heard about this claim? Uh, I have a general sense of it from from what Faith was saying, but I haven't yeah, yeah. heard of it like. Traditionally, it was like nobles in times of plenty would have a bunch of kids and they would all survive, but like only one person can be the king. So then you have a bunch of like second sons and third sons, and they want to be rich and famous and all right, yeah, right, they, they, have a bunch of kids. Yeah. And, and then the status, like, so mm -hmm. even though our society gets bigger, um, status positions maybe don't scale exactly. Okay, so you might have an overinflation of the top end of a status tree, right? Because you need like. Mm -hmm. You need a pyramid shape in almost in a in a status yeah. hierarchy. Yeah, and it's like a Matt Matt Fraser. So you end up with a bunch of disenfranchised, really smart people with a bunch of free time and a bunch of money, and that destabilizes governments and can cause like wars because they're bored. That's okay. it. And I think w w that it's almost obvious that like having like like making them lower status it isn't really. It's not a viable option not because a viable they have option. like. Yeah. The connections and they have the education and they have the money and you're never going to remove that status from them because it's sort of intrinsic like you can't really take that away and power. people get really unhappy if you try to make them lower status right? <laughs> yeah, they get yeah. super yeah. mad about probably i've heard the neurotypicals do not go for that at all <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even even worse than probably taking someone's money away i think status yeah. is like you know the chimp brain like people freak out because mm -hmm. imagine if all your friends decided statistically they had to hate you yep 
Right. Well, and, and also, so, you know, part of this could be like, um, you know, it's the Flynn effect. Everyone's getting smarter, right? You know, over the decades, right? People mm -hmm. are just getting smarter for whatever reason. We took lead out of the water, and, except out for out rare water. exceptions. <laughs> yeah, There's yeah, also yeah. Better, better, like, psychological tools of, like, people kind of get, like, yeah. how to, oh, I kind of understand what a loan is, and then they teach that to their kids. Yeah. Better, better and, like, people are less abusive to their kids now, so they end up with less weird psychiatric problems. Yeah, true. Right? So they're, less, they're less ill. Um, but also, it's interesting because, you know, the our institutions have not scaled with um, population growth. Like, so especially, like, college especially class ha incoming sizes. Harvard, like, UNC, right. Chapel Hill, enrollment over time. He's Googling, I'm, by the way. I am. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really cut. Anyway, so, so I know Harvard has not scaled at all. I know Harvard to refused to use their money to double their incoming class size because they didn't want to dilute the Harvard brand. And I really feel that really highlights it's a positional good and not sort of... Yep. What's the opposite of a positional good? I don't know. Uh, a, a valuable yeah. good. <laughs> a good that's just a good, a good in itself. Good in itself it yeah. doesn't matter. So, yeah, yeah. so I mean, uh, I think we should, you know, hashtag tax the endowments um, of, these, uh, of these institutions. So, you know, Harvard, like, yeah. if you don't, you know, if you really do have the best education in the world, why don't you share it with everyone? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, that, that's online, a real question. Why don't you give a Harvard yeah. degree to everyone who completes the online courses if you're Zooming the classes anyway? Yep, because it's right. just purely positional. Which creates these arm races. That's like, um, so uh, funny enough, Glenn's wearing a CrossFit shirt right now. Uh, so if you look, if you look at uh, CrossFit uh, games, athletes is super uh, fitness nerdy. But over time, it's just this like incredible arms race, right? Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. like it, it's so incredibly competitive. You know, athletes ten years ago, like um, you know, there's a guy I'm mildly acquainted with. I follow him on Twitter, and we've, we've chatted a couple times. Russ Green, but he competed at the CrossFit Games, and I'll be honest, you know, that was in 2010. I, I guarantee you Russ couldn't compete right now. He's a very fit <laughs> person, right? Like, uh, <laughs> and, and, and the athletes just get shorter and more compact and just you know, denser. They're, they're and all they're five like, foot nine and ten pounds. Are they doing steroids creatine. or is that not? I mean, probably. Uh, yeah, probably. probably. So. They're probably cycling. They're doing enough creatine, it doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly, like a lot of steroids. But, yeah. you know, like, so, and they have to train eight hours a day or nine hours a day. You yeah. have to eat right and you have to take performance bands and drugs, and that's the price of the... So, like, a little bit of competition like that in a purely positional game mm -hmm. creates, like, you know, the people get a lot fitter, but, like, at the expense of what, right? Like, yeah, a lot. I don't know. But it's very much the same thing with Harvard, right? So, you mm -hmm. know, like, all these kids losing their mind, uh, you know, like... Working 80 hours a week studying just to get that top 1%. And, and even, like, 1% isn't good enough, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, at this point, it's, it's really Like, I was the bizarre. valedictorian. I didn't get into Harvard, like... Right, you know, like, that's <laughs> yeah. not going to happen, That was right? not going to happen. They didn't even send me, like, a rejection letter. Like, you, they're no, taking no. my $60 for the application. Oh, yeah, and they're like, thank you for increasing our, uh, our decreasing and our acceptance, acceptance rate, rates, right? Yeah. And there's also this interesting thing that you almost, they, you, you kind of hit on there, is, like, um, if you are that 1% of whatever pool you're selecting from, so, like, our high school when we were growing up, if you're yeah. faith, if you're the valedictorian, if you're the 1%, it's, like, being the 1%, being that super high-ranking, high-status person, uh, doesn't mean as much to you as the person who wants to be, who's like in the fifth percent, who says, "Oh, I could be the one percent. I'm really grinding for it. I'm really grinding for it." But like, and so, and then you you expand your pool, your pool, right? And, the whole world now. Mm -hmm. Right. Our mom calls us getting ponded, and you <laughs> say, oh, "Okay, ponded. well, I'll go." Because you're a small fish in a big ponded. pond. Yeah. 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 And so, oh, okay, I'll I'll apply to Harvard. You know what? No, I don't really care that I was a valedictorian, but I was, so I have the status, and so right. you know, let me try to get that more status. And then they're like, "Oh, you you came from this super small pond. Well, we're the ocean," and they smack you down, and then you realize, "Hold up, uh, doesn't matter that you're the one percent on this specific hierarchy of right." Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I think that brings up a great segue to another idea I've been thinking about. Um, always trying to recognize what game you're playing and what the rewards are if you win them. Mm -hmm. um, because and who do you have like, to edge out? To like, right, and who do you have to beat? Like, like never play zero-sum games. Exactly. Right? exactly. So I, I have a friend, um, and she's a younger person, and I love, I love talking. I have, I have friends that are a lot older than I am, and I have friends that are a lot younger than I am. And I and carefully you'll get canceled. I know. So people think <laughs> people think this is like really weird. Like even Abby sometimes she's like, well, why are you on I know? It's like she's, fifty. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, like I really like the perspective because it gives me a, an idea of what happens when you get there and where you were. And it gives you some positional idea of like where you are in life. Um, but you know, she's a much younger person. She's in college right now and um, you know, really uh, worried about 
status and what she's going to do and like call it like college and career and things like that you know and she wants do her to be, parents have money or is she like out on the streets if she doesn't get a job uh you know it's important for her to get a job but mm-hmm. she's you know she wants to be a high status go into a high status field i won't say mm-hmm. which um and well, so let's say it's finance i'm just making this up but so let's say she wants to go into finance right um what i've been trying to imprint is this idea that look like Okay, let's say you win this game mm-hmm. and you work at uh, the top investment bank. You and work at Goldman Sachs for 80 hours a week for six years. Exactly. So, you know, like you, you can make a lot of money. That's probably the best part about it. You can make like a good amount of money. Um, but, you know, and, and maybe finance is bad because I, I want to focus more on a social good kind of thing. Um, but, you know, the, you would, you're, you're only going to be marginally better than the person that would be doing the job. Mm-hmm. Like, if you don't do the job, it might be 1% worse, but it's so competitive that, like, it would be a, almost a wash. Like, it would be very difficult so to So kind tell. of like with doctors, if the next person who would have gotten your space in med school that was, like, that much less yeah, good we, as you, you know, half point was less a doctor cat, instead, right? it might have been, like, a half of a percentage point on how good a doctor they're going to end up being. Yeah, and, like, it, mm-hmm. it all ends up a wash. Yeah. But if you can find things that you can do that, like, oh, God, if you don't do it, does not happen... I think that's where you can find meaning, and mm-hmm. I think that that really eases people's kind of status anxiety a lot because, like, I um, think people are built to sort of be good at one thing. Like, if you're in a village of fifty people and you're like an okay woodworker, but you're the best woodworker for fifty miles, you're gonna yeah. have a lot of status. But if you live in a huge city and there you're like there's a hundred more there hundred woodworkers, you can work really hard to be a better woodworker, and that'll give you neuroses. Right. Or you can be like an okay woodworker, which is all will also give you neuroses. Right. Right. You yep. Know? Yep. Yep. I think it's interesting, right? And, and like, yeah, you know, I see this in like, even in like my gym. You know, like I am like probably top quartile for strength, maybe maybe higher than that for men. Um, which feels pretty good, but you know, the All second the Jarvis I, children are built like Neanderthals. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty stocky. Big, big brow bones. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Got that big clean. Um, but That's yeah. why he's good at that. Uh, but, but the real, but if, whenever I go to competitions, it's like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, yeah. Nothing. Like nothing. Will right, and I did know? a competition together and we went. <laughs> it's and great, like, right? We walked in, we were like, yeah, we're pretty strong dudes for our CrossFit gym. We're fine, we're right? Pretty, we're okay. We're, I'm not we're very good fit, right? whatever, yeah. but. And then we we go in and just the roar of the massage guns going off. It's of the amazing. Bro, <laughs> looking. They had their CrossFit shoes strapped yeah. up, tied they're to ready the, to go. Right? Yeah. Yeah. They're like they have like you know ankle pads, wrist exactly. wraps. They're, it's like oh okay, so maybe we're not gonna really compete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, just for fun, right? And, and this this is another idea I have. If you truly want to comp- like, I, I don't suggest people like try and compete often. I think generally you should only compete like. When you really want it, and you really think it's a valid thing to do, specifically in CrossFit, you're talking about, right? Uh, Not or, just like no, in the entire, oh, you should in, in be life, in life. Okay. Um, you, but, don't compete constantly because you'll sort of. Well, like you know, you've got limited. T- you should only ever compete or fight for something if you know, like if you know you can win, you should try to win very fast. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Like yeah. so, like uh, I don't think like so. You know, I've, I've. You mean don't go to law school and compete with your classmates on a curve for four years? Right, you know, exactly, exactly, like, you know, maybe avoid that. So I have a friend, he's like, you know, well, like, you know, you're really strong. You should, like, try and, like, compete in Olympic weightlifting. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that because I only want to compete in that if I won't, if I'm going to be prepared to win. Do you see what yeah. I'm saying? And I'm not willing to trade that. So, like, I'll do it for fun, like, you know, fit. You don't so, want to work, eight hour, work out eight hours a day? Exactly, like, I'm not interested <laughs> in that. Like, I, I, I Only work. eat raw sweet potatoes. Exactly. <laughs> I, I only go to the gym for yeah. my health mm-hmm. and to see friends, right? Mm-hmm. And it fulfills that, and I win at that mission. But if you want to compete, I think you should generally, um, you should be prepared to win, and you should be willing to sacrifice to get there and under, try and understand that before you jump in. I think too many people jump in to these crazy status games, um, and they don't really understand, like, well, all I win is this, like, crappy trophy? Like, why the heck would I spend that much time doing it? Makes me think about the basketball league we played in when we were very younger. Right. Yeah. Like, none of us were good at basketball. No, we're not good at most Christ like <laughs> so every bad. week because so they bad. couldn't give me like most, most rebounds or whatever. Oh, yeah. They gave us these little stars that were like, yeah. oh, you were the best. I don't rebounder, know, offense, best rebounder, rebounder. <laughs> shooter, and then or they had another one for if you're like not a very great basketball player. It was say, most Christ. No, you, yeah, most Christ. I, have, it was the I gray still have that jersey. It's like <laughs> seven. It was like gray stars. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, oh man. <laughs> oh. But you will, you will know though, Glenn. Then when we went to that competition, when we decided to compete, 
we put out more effort than was like th- there was no there's nothing left on the table nothing no there was i guarantee i have no you know what i mean like whenever we go into like whenever we actually decide to compete on something gonna hit it hard we will gonna, kill ourselves right. carry right. oh them back We're, to the cars so they couldn't lift their legs and yes carry. i mean it's just which is an interesting like i, I don't know i i think mm-hmm. people i i don't like to compete i i tend to i want to avoid it but if we do if you ever do compete um I hate losing, and if you ever met a good loser, you met a loser, right? <laughs> Put in a good showing is what losers say. Yeah, know? exactly. No, I mean, I, I, seriously, and I, I don't it's know. What I think that's what winners important. say to losers to make them compete hard to make themselves look better. I think. Yeah, yeah. And it's also like um, sometimes losing, and when you really try hard, is like a signal to you to find a different axis <laughs> to compete on. Yes. And if you put it all out there, it's like, man, that's not... This that's is not, not enough. I mean, maybe that's something, too. You know, yeah. you learn. Yeah, and also, sometimes sometimes that's not exactly true. Sometimes, like, you know, you lose real hard, and then you realize, oh, but there's potential for me to be the best. If I change X, Y, Z. If I change that. this, that, and that, yeah. And, um, but sometimes it's like, it tells you, oh, this game isn't something that's very fair, so maybe it would be, like... <laughs> bad for you to compete real hard and then still lose, and then you've wasted all these resources. So, and for context, we play Modern good. Warfare four hours we a play week for an hour a day. All together. <laughs> yeah, you know, 30 more minutes an hour. We try yeah. and get on every because once in a while. Can, it's got voice chat for all yeah, different other. types of So, and, and, and background, so during quarantine and even now, you know, you mm-hmm. can't, we can't really get together to see each other or see, even go out and see friends, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, coronavirus is still. Has community Thanks, spread. Trump. Oh my God! <laughs> so shut down <laughs> large universities, which we might be yeah. sitting on <laughs> an hour before you can't get your tuition back. Exactly. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah. hunt, 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 hunt. Um, but so we started playing this this free game, and it was mm-hmm. perfect because uh, you could play it cross platform. So Glenn has a computer, I'm an Xbox, Faith has a PlayStation. Oh God! <laughs> so so we can all get together and we can all uh, all play together, and mm-hmm. uh, been really fun, right? But it was just it's it's interesting. So you're talking about that. Yeah. So. It, we started out and we were really bad at really the so entire really terrible, thing, really so, and, and it's just yeah. for fun. And like yeah. this is an example where it's like when I would get pwned by thirteen year olds with sniper rifles from like sixteen hundred feet away. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. So we keep playing, we get better and better, and then we win, and we're like, oh my god, we won! And then like, and then what? And then we're like, yeah. what? What? Ha- well, like why do we spend well, all this? Why do, time? why do we spend? Well, you know, and, and, and we got the value from it because we actually yeah. you know came up with this idea of talking because mm-hmm. we just end up talking all the time, right? Yeah. It's just like this form to. To talk in reality with mm-hmm. this one other goal we all work toward together, but, but it's a little just funny. Really realize what the point of it was. <laughs> it's like, it's there's not no like real point. To win it's completely over boring. the thirteen year olds. <laughs> exactly. so we'll be like, we'll be like in a helicopter with all our guns and stuff, and we're flying to the objective. And then Faith's like talking about rim des- rim desvier or whatever it's called. Rim desvier. <laughs> and we're like, oh, what? Let me like, go on board with this. Jump out of the helicopter and <laughs> slam onto the ground. And that that does often, yeah. End, end we end up getting shocked as we're talking about something. Yeah. <laughs> this is pretty awesome. You're telling me they're overproducing a lease? Oh, my God. Like, 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 <laughs> the 13-year-old who hears, like, the last 10 seconds of your audio after you kill them and is like, what the fuck are they talking yeah, about? Yeah, like, this makes no sense at all, yeah. at all, which is uh, pretty interesting. Um, so we talked a lot about how the competition. We talked about uh, elite overproduction. Um, what are some other solutions to the problem of having, um, you know, and uh, like general status anxiety in the air because I think that is incredibly high in people. Um, well, you could segment people into little groups, right? So I, I think so if you have everyone only has ten friends exactly and they all have the same ten friends, then one out of ten people can be the coolest person in their friend group and like the smartest person. Yeah. So then you can't be friends with anybody else though. Well, you'll find someone who's like cooler than you are. So that's one. what I think we're gonna end up doing is like you don't talk to anyone outside of your little niche. Just because Facebook smaller. is doing that right now, right? Like you only see liberal people. content if you're a liberal and dem- and conservative content if you're they conservative. Just, just so you just segment place. society so oh everyone can be elite in something and that'll so, keep them from burning Portland down. So yeah. I think, you know, so, so social media has kind of expanded the sizes of our social groups. But I think it also has the potential to solidify our smaller social groups. So, like, um, if your church has a Facebook page and it's like, you know, oh, you got 50 people in your church, then then that can kind of do what you're saying is kind of, like, solidify your smaller social groups. Mm-hmm. But there's also the potential when you're like, oh, I'm in, you know, this Facebook group of, you know, 400,000 Redditors or whatever. Yeah. It's like, I well, I'm just one person in all of this. And, yep. and you get that. Yeah, you, you, you 
you have no idea where you are on the social hierarchy anymore. Mm -hmm. that, that's super interesting because it, it feels like the internet has had this like uh, compression effect. It, well, so in one sense, it's amazing, right? Because if you had some wacky thing you're interested in, like uh, what's a good silkworms. example? Silkworms. Yeah. So your face the interest in silkworms right mm -hmm. now. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in your small town, there I guarantee there's no one else who's interested in silkworms. Nobody, mm -hmm. not one person. Not one person. <laughs> there's nobody else interested in, in this. Room. In Rocky Mount, no one. can't make anyone interested in it. No, <laughs> no. She, she, she's going to give the pitch in a minute, so maybe, yeah. maybe the audience. Maybe will, so. We'll find will pass it. Judgment Email on. me if you think it's really cool. But. Exactly, um, but uh, so in one sense you can connect with those people, but mm -hmm. in the other sense, people are incredibly lonely. Yeah. Have you like have you? You guys notice this like and, and something i think our listeners that are in major cities in the united states will not understand is just how lonely and bombed out a lot of the country is if you get outside of the metropolitan areas i live in greenville north carolina for reference and there's nowhere to go to meet and hang out with people that's not like in my house but i don't want to invite now. strangers into my house so i don't make new friends so much that's so right. I used to have my old friends from college, and some people don't go to college. So they have their old friends from high school yep. or like middle school, which really locks in a bunch of toxic dynamics because you know you can't go anywhere else if someone is abusive or if someone is just like yep. not fun to hang out with. And people don't move anymore. No. Like statistically, they, people, Americans do not move to different places. Like they either incredibly locked into where they are, which is weird, right? Because like you know, it's the internet revolution. Yeah. yeah, it should be all distributed. Connect to anyone in the world. But but, it, but you so, just connect to the people also in Greenville, North Carolina. Exactly. You know? And even the people that you know are supposed to be the best of this in San Francisco and the mm -hmm. tech sector, they're all there. There's yeah. more concentration. <laughs> yeah, there's not less concentration. Yeah. And you know they'd leave if they could because there's so much poop on the streets. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah San Francisco, California, this governance is, uh, it's frankly, Gavin Newsom, if you're listening, it's embarrassing. Please. You're the laughing stock of North Carolina. It's hilarious. I mean, you know, Roy Cooper gets us power. I don't know. Like, yeah. he can clean the power lines off. <laughs> there are <laughs> used drug that? needles on my streets. Right, exactly. And you know there's way more drug dealers in Greenville, so. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't know. It's just, it's fascinating how, but even with that, you know, it's still a massive concentration in the tech sector in San Francisco. Less mm -hmm. so now, I'm assuming, because it's so expensive and people are heading out. And like somebody has to sell you coffee, so if you pay them seven twenty five an hour, how are they supposed they, they to do that? They can't. They yeah. can't. Yeah, you can't live yep. on that. No, yeah, it's like it's it's uh you know, and and San Francisco is the future of America is so disturbing, because just the not so inequality. I was reading a book. You guys know who Freddie DeBoer is? No idea. Uh, so DeBoer I, Diamonds. Uh, no, no. no. So, yeah. so he's a, he's a blogger. I really enjoy his writing. Uh, super lefty guy. Um, but he's very intellectually honest. A lot of interesting things to say. So he's an English educator, um, got a PhD, and he wrote a, just finished a book I highly recommend called The Cult of Smart. And so the, the thesis of The Cult of Smart is that, like, we're obsessed with academic achievement right now, but if you gave everybody a college education today, um, the wage premium would disappear. So the wage premium of the college, I, maybe I should say that again, the wage premium um, would disappear for college-educated people if we gave everybody a college degree right now. It'd become like a high school degree, but you'd have to spend four more years in high school. Exactly. Um, and there's a lot of people that don't love academics. Um, and that's okay. If you want to yeah. wrestle instead of learning calculus, that's fine. Or if you want to weld, or if you want to work on cars, or if you want to... Or raise your kids. Thousand. Exactly. Like, exactly. Yeah. If you would rather do that than learn calculus, that's probably a more healthy choice than what we do. Or clean houses all day, like that friend yeah. you owned on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for reference... They were talking about communes, and one person chimed in, and they were like, an old college acquaintance of mine. And she was like, yeah, I am I would just love to just clean a house all day and then just do whatever I wanted. And I'm like, well, why don't you just be a house cleaner and not be dependent on a man or the four other people in your commune That's to fair. feed you? But Communes, well, you yeah. know, we, we can talk about communes more and some of the problems with I mean, that. if you've ever lived Property in a dorm, rights. it's like a dorm, but with 40-year-olds that never do any dishes. Yeah, right? absolutely. That's a commune. Absolutely. Um, so, the, so the cult of smart idea essentially is that, you know, we have hollowed out, like, options. So now, you know, we shift off. You know, you used to be able to go work at the factory. And uh, dogmatic free shift trade. Shift off to the Uggers. You don't get paid. So. Uggers, Uggers. Uggers. There we go. No, yeah. I mean, seriously. Uh, and that, that has happened. And it, all, most of that, I think, happened at the hand of economists who were free trade doctrinaires um, in the 80s and 90s who thought, you know what, like, 
And, and I remember taking Econ 101. I don't know if you guys have had to take Econ. You guys yeah. I escaped it. Okay, so um, I remember the classic example. I remember sitting uh, there and seeing this was like, um, so they're describing the gains from free trade. It's like, well, you know, we get cheaper goods because there's people with comparative advantage. You know, don't have to pay people or whatever because they're in internment camps in, <laughs> in Western China, right? Um, and uh, just an example, but there's plenty of others. Uh, so pretty sure people occasionally boycotting their shit is less expensive than paying a living wage. So exactly. You so you know, like, so they went with it. Um, and the idea was that, well, these factory workers, you know, they might lose their jobs, but they can retrain, and they'll have these cheaper goods. Hashtag learn to code. Hashtag learn to code, right? If you're a journalist listening to this, it's out of work. But, right, exactly. <laughs> but, 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 you know, th th this ignores the fact that, um, you know, there are negative externalities to people that are less well off. You know, the externalities are not happening to economists. They're not. That, that's what I would say. In fact, they're, they're more jobs not for economists. Not to the tenured professors. No. I, I like to call that stickiness within the model. It's like something's like, there are things which make this incorrect, right? Right. And it, it, so it's like, you might have a machine which kind of looks like what you think the reality is, but <laughs> it, there's something sticky in it, so right, right, it's not right. really going to run exactly like you're saying. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and uh, this is a phenomenon I like to talk about called, uh, how big are the edge cases? Edge ca so yeah. how big, and the edge case here is that, like, you destroy people's lives and they're all going to be... Uh, you know, using pain pills and things like that because mm -hmm. they, they don't have a source of meaning where it used to be you could go and you could work and provide for your family and it was like, it was honorable and like work was respected, work was not res Yeah, and I, I think that's like a really, I remember, the, you do remember the, there was an actor recently who was famous in the 90s but he's working at Trader Joe's now, like falling on hard times. And, you know, everybody was making fun of him on Twitter. Like, that's yeah. way more beneficial to society to work at Trader Joe's than to be an actor. <laughs> yeah. Right? No, I'm like, you know, like, like, to hand people peanuts is better for the economy than absolutely. to be a one person better actor than the next person in line exactly. for that job. And I thought that was just right. so embarrassing, right? You know, like, this guy's out there, you know, trying to provide for his family, mm -hmm. make the world a better place. Um, and, you know, everybody's just, you know, being terrible to him. Like, I don't find it embarrassing to work at Trader Joe's, like oh, I don't find it embarrassing to work anywhere. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like I mean, if you've got a job, someone finds value in what you're doing. You exactly, know? in a way that like I think people don't realize. Like they literally, someone has to pay for that. They, yeah, there is so, a revealed preference, mm -hmm. right? That it's valuable. Someone wanted you to do that so much, it made their life so much better. They were willing to pay you money to do it, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And you know they might not act like it. There's a, there's a million Karens in the world, but right. even though even the worst Karen is gonna still has to pay the money or or has chosen to pay the money yep. for you to do that that service for you to give them that coffee. Like that's right. Obviously, that's right. she thinks you're pretty great, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what else do we want to talk about? I had something there. Well, I have an example of um, for for the graduate students in the audience, yeah. I guess. Um, so. The way we do it in my college is mechanical engineers have a final project which lasts an entire senior year, mm -hmm. and companies come in and give us contracts, and yeah, we waive our IP rights and stuff like that. But <laughs> anyway, so you can be slave labor. But yeah, we, so we show to them, we show to actual companies that we have the design knowledge to actually produce something. And so sometimes that goes good and sometimes that goes bad. But um, we, so I was assigned to my group or whatever, and. Uh, I was talking to the graduate student who is kind of over us, who's like teaching us, and I said, oh, so, I, you know, I really want to kick this out of the park. Um, you must have done this since you're a mechanical engineering graduate student. You've graduated mechanical engineering. Um, what can you tell us about this real hardworking project where, you know, we get to really showcase our skills to be like, oh, we are productive? And he said, oh, I got to do research instead of doing a design project, so... I've never actually designed anything. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> like, oh Amazing. damn! Yeah. Amazing. And I mean, it was like Amazing. it was like there were crickets in the Zoom call. <laughs> like, oh, I don't know God. who let them in. I don't know how they got <laughs> computers, but the crickets were there. And so, I, I mean, that was just a firsthand experience of like, okay, so you're becoming a graduate student to get a PhD in something, and you aren't any further along. Like, okay, you, you're teaching a class and you're doing research, but I mean, it's obvious that the yeah. research isn't going anywhere, and it's also obvious that, like, you trying to explain to us how we're going to do this design project is silly. It's like, I, I don't, you're not. You're, you're not really you never... caught. That, that's like, have you ever heard of the institu institutionalization of instruments? No, what's by that? By Carol Quigley? Okay, so this is Bill Clinton's favorite book. 
Bill Clinton looks like, and he's going to get canceled now because one of those Epstein girls was rubbing his back, and I got pictures of it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, side note. I'm not it's really even, bad. It's horrible. Um, I called so this like two years ago. Yeah, I mean, Whatever. anyway, so he was on the plane, so I was like, God, he might well all the politicians were on the plane. Yeah, like replace them with women because they won't. That's fair. But, you know, they, as statistically, a lot less likely to do it. Statistically, um, so, all women should be president. Uh, so, Pre- all presidents should be women. <laughs> all, all, all <laughs> if men not raping other women is a priority for you. That's right, that's right. Which, yeah. you know, that's, uh, that's high on my priority list. Um, so he wrote this book, uh, Evolution of Civilizations. It's quite good. Um, Bill Clinton's favorite book. I, I've just finished reading it. Highly recommended. He has this concept called institutionalization of instruments. So have you ever thought about how we got college football? No. Okay. So do you know what an inst- inst- something that's instrumental is? Vaguely. So it's, it, it, it's like... So the thing is, and I will get the philosophy definition pulled up here because I don't screw it up. Mental philosophy definition. Here we go. Um, intrinsic value are this... Di- okay. Da, da, da. So it's like uh, means to an end, if that makes sense. Okay. So, so things are deemed to have instrumental value if they help one achieve a particular end. Yeah. So like music has an instrument of value for whatever we because we find pleasure to the ear. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, originally, college but pleasure pl- to the ear would be like an intrinsic value, I guess. Yeah, that'd be okay, intrinsic yeah. value. Um, so college football began because uh, essentially uh, in the Ivy League, kids were getting fat; they weren't exercising. Um, and so they're like, well, we'll come up with this cool game. And it was originally just running. Just, running. just run the ball. It's very similar to rugby. Um, and, you know, so people That was go, before the disposable black kids came in, and then they added Oh, God. <laughs> so, so, Jesus. It, no, it's true. It's, yeah. it's, it's weird yeah. when you look at it. I yeah. mean, I mean not it's paying these kids. Sketchy. It's like a cartel designed they all not have TBIs, to pay them. but you're paying them with education. Yeah, you know, the yeah. tau proteins don't care about the uh, you know, education you don't get because they tutored it in. <laughs> Um, pretty bad. That's the story for another day. But um, so th- the idea is like, okay, how do we get from that? It's like an exercise like thing, like we use P game mm-hmm. to which is an intrinsic value. Right, it's right. To, to like fifty six thousand people in Carter Finley Stadium. And it's like, how do we do it to get money? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. So it's like, well, what happens? So you know, you start playing the game, and then you're like, well, you know, like man, Yale keeps running it down our throats, oh, running man. it down our throats. So you're like, we well. Need you know, let's start, we'll sp- maybe... Let's get a couple of ringers A couple in. ringers. Get, That's what we did in Modern Glenda. Warfare. We got Glenn to be our ringer. <laughs> you know, Glenn, does, Glenn doesn't have the greatest grades, but you know what? We can, you we know, can put him in the ethnic studies program. Right? He can really run. He can really run the ball, right? So, you know, and so you start doing that, and suddenly, you know, like, well, the running, just running, it's kind of boring. What if we threw it? Through the ball, oh, so then they fun. had passing, right? And then suddenly, you know, like then they like, well, we need a coach because Yale's still beating us. Like what the <laughs> hell? And so it's an arms race, and then suddenly. You've got 56,000 people screaming at each other in Carter Family Stadium with the UNC NC State game. You make a couple like, billion a year, heck? and now you're stuck. It's a billion dollars. That's the coronavirus. This is the people in it. Then you have like it. hundreds of thousands of people in the parking lot. <laughs> right. <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll back. So when you mentioned your graduate student who had never actually designed anything. Yeah. Not calling my out. Like, it's like, wow, like, it's just this institutional, institutionalization of the act of designing something, right? <laughs> yeah. And also, we have a design school. Did I tell you about that? Right? We have design yeah. school, engineering school, and the idea there is like, oh, we're going to make the products, and then, oh, we're going to make products that work, right? And it's like, <laughs> like all oh the design God. students and the engineering Did students are like, do you even know math? And all the <laughs> physics students are like, oh, engineers, you don't know math. <laughs> <laughs> you know no math, which is very odd, man, when you think about it, like how these weird things just, they're like emergent phenomenon, right, like that are somewhat random in how they come about, right? You know, mm-hmm. you just like, one day you're like, oh, you know, we should get fit on a fall day. So you toss this leather ball out there and yeah. start ramming people Speaking in the head. Speaking of immersion phenomenon, Glenn, tell them about your club idea. My club idea? Oh. Oh, it's a sport. You guys. It's, yeah, not, it's, it's a sport. It's going to be a club sport. It's going to be a real sport. But for, like, like, it's going to be made. Institutionalization yeah. of this instrument. All right. So the idea is I like I like strongman. Strongman is a sport where it's like, oh, you're lifting, but – it's kind of like, oh, weird, awkward things, and so we're going to lift couches this year or whatever. Now like we're going to hold trucks. Bars One time it was bars. like a giant rock sphere. Right, and so I, whenever I see that, I'm like, oh, man, if you only had like like one lever, you could just do that. And then I came up with the idea, why don't we have a standardized toolkit or something like that? And then the only goal is who can get one thing from one place to another, and you use you know whatever mechanical advantage you want because you still have to put in the power yourself, right? You can't have, like, power tools and all that. That's no fun. Yeah. What you want is, like, you know, 
oh, are you going to spend the extra minute to set up this intricate pulley system, or are you going to get Will, who's 200 pounds heavier than everybody else, <laughs> to just pick the dang thing up and throw it or whatever? So you and start so, with, like, a 300-pound square, and you have to move it 100 yards, and you have a toolkit. So it's whoever can just get it to the other end of the field first wins. Right, and so it's like, like team one here. is hammering in their, their pulley system, and team two is has their lever system really going well, and team three is just really throwing that thing hard. And Will's just carrying it above his right. head. He's probably going to snap his torso oh, before God. he gets 50 oh, feet, but it's fun to watch. <laughs> it's really cool. So that was my idea for a little sport, and I don't know. I think it'd be fun. That's awesome. I, you know, I'd I, watch it on YouTube. I really like it. I really like the combination of like, uh, you know, you've got to, you got to be smart enough to, you know, there's like this interplay of being smart and you also have to be fit enough to move it and like, you know, how that plays together is pretty interesting. And in every sport, you know, somebody's tall or somebody's shorter, there's mechanical advantages where it's like, there's, there's no true fairness. And I kind of like the idea in some sports where it's just like, all right, less rules can be more fun because it allows us ingenuity to come in. And I think that's the coolest the aspect, to right? The when somebody yeah. learned to dunk in basketball or to goaltend, it's like that can go positive or negative, right? Because everybody loves right, dunking, right. but nobody loves goaltending. And so yep. instead of adding more rules, you, sh you could find a, a way to go about it where having less rules inspires more creativity. That's really interesting. But that's really cool. Ha don't even have a name for it. Just an idea. That's a cool idea. I love that kind of competition idea. Well, that's our show for today. I'm Will Jarvis. And I'm Will's dad. Join us next week for more narratives. Thank you.